You are listening to a Higher Things production. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents The Uncultured Saints with Pastors Eli Leedsow and Harrison Goodman. Man, okay, let's start. Because it's not getting any better. No, it's right? only downhill from here. It's Plus not, you're mad. I, so yeah, when you're mad, I know we're going to get a good podcast episode. Nice solo cup. So we're in uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 18. And uh, John's disciples and the Pharisees yeah, all the colors, were All the fasting. colors of the rainbow in, in, uh, in, in the kitchen. <laughs> I tried. And the people. This, this doesn't have any uh, uh, liturgical color. Uh, came but, uh, I've got and them. said got to Jesus. And I've got purple. Why red. do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But they your disciples do not fast. Because I'm Roman Catholic. <laughs> and Jesus <laughs> said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old computer. If he does, the patch tears away from it. And the new and the old and the worst Crash. tears made. <laughs> Freeze, no one puts right. new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins. And the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You got that Thanks. joy, 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 joy down in your heart. Let's go. Um, yeah. So what's this all about? Why do the Pharisees um, care about fasting, huh? Well, so. I know. I know why. Tell me why. Because they, just like all the rest of us, uh, want to uh, prove how good they are and how much they love God. Right. Right? Yeah. Plus, if if you eat too much, that's not healthy, you know? Chicken in China, the Chinese chicken. If you have a drumstick, your brain stops ticking. So angry. (laughs) I'm here to make your day worse. Um, so, but this is actually it though. Um, your, your catechism talks about this. Fasting and bodily preparation uh, are certainly fine outward training. Like th- they are, um, but they can't do some things though. The, the person is truly worthy and well prepared to us faith in these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Um, it's it's always us to sort of take a good practice and then try and make it salvific. It's always us to sort of take a, a good thing that God gives us and say, I can use this for a better thing than he gave it to me for. I can use this to be everything because I can do this, right? Right, right. And I mean, goodness, I, I, I bet that uh, uh, fasting is all but gone out of uh, uh, our, our uh, pious practice uh, within most Lutheran circles. Um, good thing, bad thing, I'd probably not the best thing um because our lord has given it to us but again this is again the the, the fasting is for partly for a gift right it, it, it's it's to help us uh, uh know that we don't live uh, off of bread alone but uh, by every word that comes from the mouth of the lord and, and it, it's supposed to refocus us and all of this and yet uh the pharisees have turned it into something else the pharisees have turned it into this work that enables them uh to stand before god on a higher plateau than everybody else right um you're just getting a billion texts i can hear something buzzing over there man yeah actually i did just get a billion texts um yeah, phone's i'm blowing ignoring up. them for you because hey, I, I i love you not for me um, not for me for the for the four listeners right so um here's the the thing though uh that the pharisees don't understand they are actually standing before the lord this is not the time to fast because the lord is actually is actually here um again this is this has nothing to do with your preparation this has to do with where jesus is um and in the same way like if jesus says to you i don't know take eat this is my body for you for the forgiveness of sins um the the correct answer might not be yeah but like i should i should probably do something to show you that i'm worthy of it right <clears throat> right and and that's the odd thing so so this is uh uh jesus is going to be talking about this with the uh with the the cloth on the computer screen and the uh the old wine skins and the new wine right uh he, this is this is old covenant new covenant sort of stuff 
And he's not saying that the old wineskins are bad. And he's not saying that the old cloth was bad, right? They they were good and they, they served a purpose, right? Well, they and still so, are good too. Like it's not even that they stopped being good. It's just that they're not doing the thing that you're hoping they'll do. Well, yeah. But I mean, if you go complete old covenant, new covenant, right? So Jesus is now fulfilling. He's in the place of, of uh, uh, fulfilling that old covenant. And so everything that the Pharisees were doing, everything that the John the Baptist was kind of pointing forward to, but presumably everything that the Pharisees were doing for good th- reasons, just give them the benefit of the doubt, um, all of that's fulfilled, right? It's fulfilled in the, the new covenant that's come in Christ. So that whole old covenant, all of the, all of the uh, preparatory things that they were supposed to do, all the clean and unclean, all of this sort of stuff— it is now fulfilled finally in Christ. And Jesus is showing that every single day when he's actually going about his business and he's uh, uh, going against that old uh, covenant, uh, the strict laws, right? By by he's fulfilling it, but fulfilling it in a way that they never uh, could have possibly fathomed, right? Fulfilling it in the ways of actually going up to lepers and not just healing them, but touching them, right? When right. the old covenant says... Throw those lepers out as, as as far as you can until they are clean again. And Jesus is like, nah, come here. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> right. So uh, here's the thing, though. Um, when you start to mix that free gospel in with the old the old works, you pollute the gospel. Um, Jesus says that the wine itself is destroyed, as are the skin. So when you try and mix the gospel into a, um, an understanding of a legalistic Christianity, uh, follow these rules to make God happy with you, uh, to prove to him you're worthy kind of Christianity, you actually lose both. You don't even lose one or the other, uh, but you actually lose both. The, the, the skins are destroyed, and so is the wine. If you're going to mix the free gospel into works, it's no longer the free gospel anymore. It, it's at best sort of a bait and switch that everybody sees. Um, and, and and also, if you're going to mix the forgiveness of sins in with legalism, like why why legalize? Because like it's just going to be forgiven anyway. So you know, let's just sin that grace may abound. Like right. you, you always end up messing up both sides. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, for for your pastors out there who uh, who uh, went through Lutheran won't seminary to this. Right, and won't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, for the pastors out there within the uh, LCMS pulpits. Um, they uh, presumably, when they went through homiletics classes, right? This is te- teaching you how to to give sermons. Uh, they they probably read and studied uh, 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 Walther's proper distinction of law and gospel. And although there's some things in there, there's a couple of the things that maybe I'm just too dumb to understand, but I, I think are maybe a little off. But the main, some of the main things there is that you you can't mingle the law and the gospel, just like you had said. Uh, uh, Goodman, that uh, as as soon as you do that, um, you're losing both. You're not making either of them better. You're actually losing both of them. They're not actually uh, doing their proper work. The law isn't doing what it's supposed to do when you mingle it with the gospel. And the gospel can't do what it's supposed to do when you mingle it with the law. Right. So case in point, then the Sabbath itself. So um, if you want to sort of make the Sabbath day about like not working your way into heaven, and then you recognize that I'm bad at even not working, um, where, where is Jesus in any of this? Uh, because actually all of a sudden you get mad at Jesus for showing up on his own day and feeding people who are hungry and healing people who are sick. And in all the while, you're like, yeah, but I'm, I'm definitely better than you, God, because you healed a sick person. But I didn't I didn't I didn't even like open the refrigerator myself. Um, so right. clearly, we, we, we know who's in charge here. You, you see how sort of convoluted it is, but sort of in, in sort of a, a maybe a more modern practice, it might be um, the Christian who goes to church and then looks down on everybody who doesn't go to church and like gets actually really, really mad and complains all day about their dying institution and blaming the people who aren't coming to church for all of it and then getting upset with them for not wanting to come um, and then wondering why missions doesn't seem to work well for them. <laughs> <laughs> when you co-mingle the law and the gospel, the whole thing, it, it gets pretty convoluted. Um, and so you can only have so many sermons that that sort of blame society for everything and also lament that society won't come to church uh, because they don't want to hear themselves be blamed for everything wrong with you. Um, but, you know, Jesus loves you. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that, unfortunately. And and, and I'll, I'll be honest i mean there when appropriate and the text is there and it's speaking about the ills of the fallen world i think that's appropriate to do um but i think far too often it's easy again for pastors 
uh, to uh, direct the law to everybody outside the doors. Who can't yell at me for here because they're not going to hear it. Yeah. Right. Like I've never gotten right. yelled at for blaming people that weren't in the room. Um, right. And then everybody in the room is, is again, presumably or the vast majority. Lifted up above. Yeah. And you're singing to the choir. They're like, yeah, those people are awful out there. So here's the thing, though. You, you're you're supposed to call out the the world. And Luther calls it one of the three great enemies, the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. Um, but the thing is, you're a part of the world. Like, you're not above the fray. And, and this is a major sort of recognition here that, that every Christian has idols. Every Christian has worldly cares. A, every Christian is sort of stuck down here, not just sort of to endure the, the burdens of another political party, but actually to contribute to the the ills that are down here your sins hurt your neighbor and so you're the world you're the problem i don't like hearing that the law should never be a they problem the law is a you problem um the, and, and in the same way the gospel is is never a, a a try harder solution the gospel is a jesus for you because if the law is for they then who is jesus for well, it's not for you like Jesus is for them too. That's good. But if you're not even going to tell them that they're sinners that, and tell them that Jesus died for you, you're just going to blame them for stuff and say, well, but Jesus loves everybody. But like, really, you're the problem. This is mixing the new wine into the old wineskins. It's, it's going to ruin both. Yeah. Yeah. You, you and have it's, a, it's, people, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying it, it. Jesus is once again, just turning everything on its head. And it, it has to be because Again, even even if the Pharisees were doing everything perfectly, which they weren't, because they were they were uh, adding new new laws, and we're going to get to that uh, in the next section here, um, and they were looking works righteous stuff. Um, it's still really confusing when when the Messiah, when the answer literally bursts on the scene, mm-hmm. and and he he isn't, and probably can't be anywhere close to what you fathomed in your brain, right? Right. This has to be way worse than like even when you read the book before you watch the movie and none of the people look like how you imagine them. Exactly. <laughs> He's not even behaving the same way. Um, right. Because like what we want is a Jesus to sort out the they, not a Jesus to forgive the me. Right. Right. So should we uh, keep going there on chapter two, finish up chapter two, maybe? Wow. Let's what? do it. All right. So. One second. Your computer crashes again. <laughs> it's gonna do it. Well, we got we got fourteen minute podcasting. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> One Sabbath, he being Jesus was going through the grain fields, and they made their way. His disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and the Pharisees were saying to him, "Look." Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What This, I think... It proves the point um, so perfectly uh, that what Jesus is talking about here, because uh, one of these uh, plucking grain, right? Uh, presumably, when you're actually looking at Leviticus and you're looking at Deuteronomy, it, it's not expressly um, forbidden. Um, I think the closest you might have is uh, uh, trying to gather. Uh, uh, what trying to gather manna on on the Sabbath day and then it rots or whatever I can't remember how that goes but uh, uh, no Jesus uh, Yahweh doesn't give manna on the Sabbath you pick it two days on Friday right is that how it goes right that's true but like the the one that sort of popped into my head was actually with with Ruth that um there's actually commanded by the Lord uh, an insistence to leave part of the field for people to pluck the grain to eat who would otherwise right. starve to death like this is actually set aside for the least of these so that they don't starve like, um or the what travelers the and the, yeah. yeah the sojourners that if if you happen to be passing through cuz like you can't just go to McDonald's um the Lord actually insists, leave something here for the least of these to receive from God through you. And well, the Pharisees the, are like, nah. 
Well, not so much not. Nah. They're just like, yeah, you, but you can't eat on the not Sabbath. Today. Yeah, not, today. not today. Yeah, but not today. Like, right. it's not never. Like, they want to be generous because that, that's a good work before the Lord, but they would not have the Lord actually associated with it on the Lord's day. Like, exactly. the Lord's generosity, except on his day. Um, <laughs> exactly. Except on this one day that the Lord sets aside, uh, that's the day that you have to starve. <laughs> It's just so it's just so silly that they think this. And yet I I'm sitting here going, yeah, but if I was a Pharisee back then, um, yeah, I would be thinking the exact same thing. Right. I mean, why this is uh, because presumably this is one of those. Right. You can't pluck grain on a Sabbath day. This is presumably one of the hedge laws that the Pharisees set up to protect the Sabbath. Right. So, uh, you know, it's a third commandment, right? So remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. How do we do this? Okay, now we got to figure out how to do this. We're going to set up all these laws around the Sabbath to protect the Sabbath so that we don't break it. This is one of them. And now the Pharisees are saying, hey, uh, your disciples are breaking the law, equating these hedge laws with, with the, law the actual law itself and saying it's Whoa. one and the same. And it's got a deeper poison yet because what that really means, because if it has these hedge laws, what they really see is the law is a trap. The law is a burden. The law is a gotcha. It's the same thing that actually happens in the garden where Eve starts to add laws to uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, don't eat it. Don't even don't even touch it. She sees the tree as as a burden, as a trap. When I mean, and we've talked about this in another podcast. Uh, Luther saw it as the first church. Uh, she she sees the gifts of God as a trap. The law, the law itself, is it a gift from God or is it a trap? It got you from God. And if you see it as God just can't wait to send you to hell, so you better you better outsmart him. Well, you think worse that says more about you than it does about God. I mean, it really does. Right. And then and then again, we're and I think we've we've talked about this before and and uh your good Lutheran pastor should should have brought this up at some point in catechesis as well that um all the 10 commandments are uh God is actually setting up the 10 commandments uh, uh for for the gift that he's protecting there, right? It's it's protecting his name. It's protecting uh, the 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 Sabbath itself, or the way in which he's going to give himself. It's protecting life. It's protecting authority. It's protecting all of these sorts of things. So those are the things that we should be looking at. So this third commandment: remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It's not okay. I've got to make sure I don't do any work so that the Sabbath remains holy. No, the Sabbath is holy in and of itself. And why is that? Because the Lord ordained it to be the time and place in which he actually gives his good gifts. And we're going to see that actually fulfilled in, in Christ here. The next, when, in, yeah, in, in the next little section. Well, in the next, it, yeah, uh, I mean, when we finish this, but also uh, uh, chapter three itself, when it starts, we'll, we'll actually see a um, uh, an actual example of what Christ is, is, is speaking about. What I love here is Jesus uses... Um, uses, uh, he doesn't out and out say, well, Leviticus doesn't say that guys, but he says, uh, when asked, uh, by the Pharisees, why do your disciples uh, do this? He says, um, so do you remember when David did something which is expressly forbidden in Leviticus and Deuteronomy? Do you remember what he did that? Right. And he ate it, uh, and he gave it to the people that he was with because they were starving and really hungry. Um, did God smote him for that? <laughs> appropriate, appropriate tense, even. Well done. Um, <laughs> did, I think did, it was smite, but did, did, was he smited? Did, smitten? Sm was he smitten? Smote, smoted, it. smoted. Um, <laughs> no, he wasn't. And in fact, as far as we can tell, nothing that David says and nothing that Scripture says. Uh, says that he was even reprimanded for that, right? By mm -hmm. the priest, by Yahweh himself. And so Jesus is using that as an Old Testament, Old Covenant example of, hey, uh, let's think of spirit of the law as opposed to uh, letter of the law. Because again, what's the purpose of the Sabbath? Is the Sabbath, was man created for the Sabbath or was Sabbath created for man? And if we get those wrong, then we get our whole understanding of what our Lord's actually doing. Is this works righteousness? I've got to work myself uh, uh, to heaven. Or is this the Lord putting a halt on everything and saying, hey, just so you know, 
you're going to try and get yourself to heaven. So I'm going to have you sit down today so mm-hmm. that I can give you stuff. And, and then he does it, right? Because we, we could keep we right. could keep reading. Um, right. So again, Jesus entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand and they watched Jesus to see whether or not he would heal them on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Um, they they sa- He said to the man with the withered hand, come here. So he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. It's it's awesome how uh, upset they are to find God working mercy on the day that he said aside for mercy. Like right. that's against the rules. <laughs> that's right. not what this is for. And, and, and again, this is so amazing because they actually don't accuse him, right? No, because, they just get right because, to gossiping. Right. But I mean, they accuse him, but they can't publicly accuse him because uh, nowhere in their uh, 848,000 hedge laws that they had around the real laws, which we all have. Let's this, this, stop joking around. We all have these laws that we all make up, right? But nowhere in these laws... Uh, to, uh, when they're talking about what constitutes work, so what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath, nowhere in there is there a uh, don't uh, a miraculously heal somebody. <laughs> because, because why would it be right? It would be it would be like them writing down uh, don't walk on water on the Sabbath, right? And so, so here, it, here comes Jesus it, it, doing this miraculous thing, healing them, and they're like. I need to be mad, but I can't. <laughs> it's act, it's like watching little kids play freeze tag and making up new rules as they go because they don't like how it's going. Exactly. Like, you know, you know, they went, they went right back to all the bosses and be like, we got to add healing, guys. We got to add healing. We have to put that in the book. I didn't think it was possible, but we got to add healing now. I, and like, so the guy writing in the book, he's like, so we don't want people healed? Like, is that, is that it? <laughs> Is that no, we the do, Sabbath just not is on the Sabbath. Okay, so the Sabbath is the day that we pray for healing, but if it happens, we get real upset. Got you. <laughs> Got you. Oh, it was so dumb. We are so dumb when it comes to our and it's to... not even they. Give it a we. So what I do I do on the Sabbath? What do I what what's what's my law here? Oh, I don't know. You tell me what your law is. I mean, I confess unto you, uh, I, a poor, miserable sinner, uh, really have found a way to create uh, in my mind this idea that getting up and going to church with my family is a burden. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, I, I, I've, I've actually started, like, talking to people just, like, on the low. I was like, you know what? I, I actually think the Roman Catholics got right is Sunday evening church. Like, you, you, gotta, you got all day to just sort of be a family. You don't have to fight with your kids first. And 6 p.m. comes around. You, you've had your time. You go in. You receive God's gifts. And then you're ready for the forgiveness of sins. But, like, 9 in the morning, you guys, like, really – I want I want waffles. This is this is too much on the Sabbath day. <laughs> I want I want two days, two full days on the weekend to lay around and watch football. Yeah, one That's for me I and want. one for Jesus. Jesus can have the second one. Um later on in the day. Once I'm good and rested. Once I'm ready. <laughs> that's that's mine um and it, it's it i'm sure spills out all the all the more um but i i think actually for the clergy it, it might sort of have a double poison pill because like when do you actually get to go to church you, yeah, you know when, I, when you're on vacation yeah and, and that's the one time you're like i finally don't have to um plus i'm traveling and there might not be a good church around so you know um When's right. the last time like you sat in a pew with your family and had your pastor preach to you? Um, and, and like every clergy is like, yeah, in a perfect world, but like I got to get stuff done. So, you know. Yeah. Sorry. No healing for me on the Sabbath. <laughs> no, not for me. But I don't want to throw a giant pity party for pastors. That was alliteration right there. That was pretty um, good. Yeah. Pastors uh, have alliteration. Yeah, they, they really do. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's all in the Psalms, all over the place. Um, if you could read Hebrew, which I can't. So, um, <laughs> what I like, what I like about this again, what Jesus is doing here is, uh, um, it's, it's just the way in which he actually, he, he, 
the the previous account, right? And whether this happened the the week before or whatever, I, it, I, it doesn't really matter. But the previous account, he sets up the abstract notion of what the Sabbath is for and what it's always supposed to be for, right? And then here's the concrete actual example of it, how this actually plays out. And nobody can say out loud in front of their their friends. Certainly, they can't go up to the guy with the withered hand and say, I'm happy that your hand's withered, but you should have waited 12 hours, right? Mm -hmm. They can't actually say that, even though that's exactly what they mean. And I love how Jesus is is asking very pointed questions, right? Uh, uh, And where is it here? Uh, Verse 4, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? right? And so presumably he's saying, is it good to heal, right? And then he says, is it lawful uh, to, to save or to kill? Now that's an interesting thing because nowhere in the context are they talking about uh, killing, right? Um, until Jesus does what? Dies. Heals, heals the guy. Oh. And then what do they talk about? Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. That's nice. <laughs> right. They're talking about kill, murdering this. They're plotting to murder this guy on, on the, the Sabbath, Sabbath, on the day of God granting life. And Jesus in the flesh doing this for the person. And they're like, nope, this guy has to die. And the, and the word for destroy, because it says destroy. It doesn't say kill. But this destroy word. Uh, again, yeah. I'm not that smart. I looked it up in a commentary, but this destroy word, um, it it's connected to kill, right? So it's not just like I'm going to ruin your life, destroyer. It's not like I'm going it, to. It's not the same word that they would say when like a building falls down and it's destroyed. It's speaking about the person dying, but also uh, everything around them being torn down. So in the most shameful way possible, they want to destroy this man. That's what they're starting to plot already. They're they're starting to plot what the cross is going to look like. And all the while, Jesus is just giving mercy to those in need of it. Like, I actually think that, you know, like all the irony aside, which normally I'm a big fan of, um, <laughs> I think my favorite part here is just, yeah, all of that's true. And on the Sabbath, the mercy, the merciful, uh, or the the mercy is still given to those in, in need of it. The the man with the withered hand is still healed. Your sins are still forgiven, and, and it means that when when you go to church full of hypocrites, and when you when you sort of look at all the irony that goes on in your own four walls in your own sanctuary, Jesus still gives mercy to sinners on the Sabbath, and and that's that's the point. That is absolutely. And guess what? I'm gonna cut it off Chicken right butt. now because I just saw one of my parishioners trying to get into my church. Bye. We out.